Good morning and welcome to our continuing coverage of the Israel-Hamas war. I am Bukola Koka and coming up on the program... Large explosion occurs near Al-Shifa Hospital in Gaza City. Israeli army says Hamas has lost control in northern Gaza. Plus, London pro-Palestinian march to proceed as Sunak asks police for safety assurances. Thank you for joining us. We are learning as we start off that a large explosion occurred near Al Shifa Hospital in Gaza City in the early hours of today. People gathered outside the hospital could be seen running for cover after the loud impact and the flash reflected on surrounding buildings. Israel's military spokesperson near Admir Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari says Hamas has lost control of northern Gaza as thousands of residents have moved south. In Hagari's words, we saw 50,000 Gazans move from the northern Gaza Strip to the south. They're moving because they understand that Hamas has lost control and is continuing to lose control in the north. The Rear Admiral, who was speaking in a televised briefing on Wednesday, added that there would be no ceasefire, but Israel has been allowing for humanitarian pauses at specific times to give residents an opportunity to relocate south. In the occupied West Bank, Israeli forces wounded 19 Palestinians in shooting during a raid on the city of Bethlehem, which lasted more than six hours, leaving four in critical condition that's according to the Palestinian Health Ministry. Furthermore, the Palestinian Prisoners Association says Israeli forces arrested about 65 people across the West Bank on Wednesday, raising the number of Palestinians detained since October the 7th to 2,280. The Israeli army has released a video, that's in another report now, of what he says is the location of tunnels in Gaza used by Hamas. The footage posted on X showed excavators digging up earth to reveal structures underground. The army claims it has destroyed the said tunnels. And in another video, soldiers are inspecting holes in the ground with a caption reading, locating underground infrastructure and resources in the Gaza Strip. A soldier pointed downwards while saying, this is what the enemy uses to circulate air underground. And wherever you look in northern Gaza, you see destruction and desolation a month into Israel's military campaign to oust Hamas from the enclave. There are blackened windows, shattered bedrooms and pockmarked walls everywhere. Israeli forces gave a small group of foreign reporters a rare view of their advance into the Palestinian territory on Wednesday, driving them along sandy routes to the outskirts of Gaza City. At a cluster of apartment blocks, Every building within sight is scarred by battle. Walls have been blown away, bullet holes and shrapnel dot the facades. The palm trees are shredded and broken. Over the past 12 days, thousands of Israeli troops have encircled Gaza City, cutting it into two as they look to hunt down and eliminate Hamas fighters. The military has repeatedly told civilians to leave the north and head to the southern end of the enclave. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu met with leaders of Israeli settlements in the occupied Palestinian West Bank and denounced acts of sometimes deadly vigilante violence committed by Israelis against Palestinian civilians. He commended the settlers who live in communities established by Israel on territory captured from Jordan in a 1967 war, which are widely viewed as illegal under international law and on Palestinian and on land Palestinians hope may one day be part of a future Palestinian state. Going by statistics from the UN Humanitarian Affairs Office, vigilante settlers' attacks have killed at least 29 people this year, eight of which are since October the 7th. These vigilante-style warriors do not represent the settler population, 
according to the Prime Minister. A Hamas military arm, al Qassam brigades, released video showing what they call close fighting with the Israeli forces on the streets of Gaza. Over the past 12 days, thousands of Israeli troops have encircled Gaza City, and according to the latest figures released, 31 Israeli soldiers have been killed during the Gaza ground offensive and more than 260 injured. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is demanding assurances from London's police chief that a pro-Palestinian march scheduled for Saturday will be held safely. Sunak summoned the chief, Commissioner Mark Rowley, to explain why he was allowing another pro-Palestinian march to proceed, saying it was disrespectful to hold it on Armistice Day when commemorations were held for those who died in war. The Palestinian Solidarity Campaign, which is organizing Saturday's march, has said it would avoid the cenotaph London's main war memorial. Police have made nearly 208 hate crime arrests since Hamas militants attacked Israel last month. Yeah, this is a decision that the Metropolitan Police Commissioner has made, and he has said that he can ensure that we safeguard remembrance uh, for the country this weekend, as well as keep the public safe. Now, my job is to hold him accountable for that, and we've asked the police for information on how they will ensure that this happens. Uh, I mean, desecration of war memorials is absolutely sickening. You know, this weekend will be about the country coming together to pay tribute and recognise the sacrifice of so many over so many years. That's what I'll be doing, and I think that's what the vast majority of this country will be doing this weekend. Let's now speak with security expert Chidi Mwanu, who's talking to us virtually from London. Thank you for joining us on our coverage of the Israel-Hamas war, Mr. Mwanu. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Yes, indeed. And we just heard from the Prime Minister uh, in London, where you are, uh, about demands of security <laughs> from the um, uh, British police as the pro-Palestinian protests will begin. We'll, we'll talk more about that later, but let's start with what seems to be important at this time. As Israel says, it is making a breakthrough with the blasting of tunnels in um, you know, the Gaza Strip. Uh, does this show that we're nearing the end of the war anytime soon? Is this a breakthrough for Israel? No, um, it's, it's not. It's not the, uh, it's, to answer your first question, it's definitely not in, uh, near the end of the war. Um, depending, of course, on what you define this war to be. So if we look at this, you know, as you know, I, I generally like to break things down on, uh, into, into their categories. And the, the, if you look at the war from a strategic point of view, there is no end in sight because there are no strategic objectives. Defeating Hamas is not necessarily a strategic objective. It's an ob operational objective, which we'll come to in a minute. And um, once you defeat Hamas, something else will replace Hamas, you know, it, Hamas's junior brother, Islamic Jihad, is still there in the wings. There will be Hamas, you know, plus one. There will be another thing that replaces Hamas that is most likely going to be more violent, more virulent than Hamas. So strategically, no, there's no end to the war. Operationally, uh, at the operational level, you know, in terms of the defeat of Hamas, isolating Gaza City is one element of that uh, operational plan. But clearly Hamas knew this was coming and clearly Hamas planned for an Israeli incursion. So until we see Hamas's response or how they intend to fight the Israeli uh, kind of forces, we, we can't say that we're close to the end of the operational phase either. Tactically, yes, the Israelis have, have, secure, have uh, made a tactical success. So at the lower level where the troops are fighting on the ground, they've managed to clear their way, fight their way in and secure that area and isolate that area. Now they have to do the really, really hard part, which is going block by block and clearing each of those buildings. Now, the Israelis have actually made their lives and their jobs harder by bombing, you know, so much of, of Gaza in that rather than having buildings to clear, they now have rubble. Buildings are logical. Buildings have structure. They have form. You can, you can kind of figure a way through them. But rubble is, is, is amorphous. It's in, you know, it, it doesn't have any shape. So it just makes the job for their soldiers much harder and much more difficult. And you're likely to see if, if Hamas chooses to contest this part of Gaza, a lot of very bloody, very brutal fighting. Mm, indeed, a uh, very instructive point that you have made there. But even prior to this time, the narrative was that 
Hamas had had 15 years to prepare for this defense. And as a matter of fact, those tunnels on the ground uh, run for hundreds of kilometers in some reports. Uh, if indeed that's the, the case and you have, you know, Israeli hostages underneath, um, you know, in those tunnels, does this make Hamas impenetrable? And add to that the point that you have made that uh, Israel bombing from, you know, the air is making its job difficult. Well, no, ha Hamas is not necessarily impenetrable. Almost inevitably, at the end of this war, they will be significantly defeated or degraded. The question is, as always, what's the cost to the Israelis going to be? What's the cost that's the Israeli military and the Israeli uh, public or citizens, and in this case, it's the hostages? And what's the cost to the Palestinian citizens going to be? Um, defeating Hamas in the tunnels will be a really horrible, hard fight. And it's unlikely that the Israelis will be able to, to close every tunnel or destroy every tunnel. But if they are able to break into the tunnel network, there's a number of things they can do, either flooding them, pumping gas, pumping cement, whatever it is, into those tunnels to block them off. The problem, as you've, as you've noted, is that Hamas holds a significant number of hostages. So anything you're doing to or in those tunnels, any you know, aggressive kinetic action you're taking in those tunnels will likely kill Israeli hostages. Now, the Israelis seem to have made, or the Israeli government seems to have made a choice that they're not overly worried about harm to the hostages because the level of the bombardments that they're subjecting Gaza to, it is almost inevitable they've killed quite a few of their own hostages. But it's going to be very difficult for you to actually have face-to-face -face fighting and you're clearing through positions where your, your um, hostages are held. This is going to create a massive problem for the Israeli forces if they do go into the tunnels. And then again, as I said, it limits their options for blocking off those tunnels or maybe flooding them with um, you know, water or with tear gas or something like that to push people out. So the Hamas might not be impenetrable, but it's, it's all about the cost. It's the cost to the Israeli military, which means you actually physically have to send people into those tunnels, which will be booby trapped, which there'll be ambushes, and you have to fight your way through them if you want to get the hostages out. And if you don't want to get the hostages out, you have to accept that you're going to sacrifice 244 people uh, in order to destroy Hamas. So it's so, and then obviously, you know, the, the bigger point is the, the cost to the Palestinian civilians, which we've seen already, is now almost over 10,000 uh, 10, lives, and it will most likely double or triple before the end of this uh, phase of the conflict. So those are the key, key questions for every plan, for the planners on both sides. For Hamas, I don't think they really care how many Palestinians are killed or how many Israelis. You know, they, they, they're rather counting it in terms of how many Israelis they can kill. But for the Israelis, um, again, I don't particularly think the Israeli government cares how many Palestinians they kill, but world opinion, will, and the opinion very more important to the Israelis of the Arab street, is, is very solidly against it them due to this high uh, casualty figure. And as if you alluded to, you know, this has caused a backlash in countries that traditionally support Israel, like, you know, the UK and the US. Well, Mr. Wanu, it could be debatable that uh, the Israelis do not particularly care how many Palestinian lives, you know, that they take amid the prosecution of this war. This is because time and again, you've heard their defense minister or the prime minister himself say uh, that, you know, they have found that Hamas is keeping rockets in, um, you know, a Boy Scout um, uh, building where children play. Uh, at times you hear, you know, in the last few days that they've discovered that they have weapons hidden under swimming pools and that, you know, that's the style, you know, that they deploy using civilians as human shields. So amid all of these, uh, what options are open to Israel in the prosecution of the war. Yeah, yeah. so, I mean, I was clear that, you know, ha Hamas clearly does not care about the lives of Palestinians because for, for some logical reasons, but also for some fair, fairly cynical reasons, most of their equipment is based in and around civilian structures. So logically, because Gaza is such a, a closely, a densely populated area, their, their military structures will co coexist with civilian structures. That, that just goes without saying. But as you've already pointed out, very cynically, they also hide their weapons in, in structures that should be protected structures, like near hospitals, schools, uh, mosques, places like that, which is, you know, a, a, a more or less a, a, can be considered a violation of the law of armed conflict, although as a non-state uh, armed actor, they're not necessarily party to it. But it, it's generally, it's very cynical, and it's, and it's very clear that they, they, they conduct these activities in order to 
not only disguise their military uh, infrastructure, but also to con compel the Israelis to commit um, uh, to cause civilian casualties. Now, why I said, you know, the Israelis seem very uh, on, less concerned about Palestinian casualties is, you know, kind of this point in that there are different ways you could prosecute this war that would maybe not completely remove Palestinian casualties, but it seriously reduce them. The absolute tonnage of bombs that's been dropped on Gaza is, is unfathomable. It's more than the U.S. dropped in Afghanistan, which is not a densely populated country uh, for over for in a year. This is... and you've got to question how are these targets prosecuted? So in terms of how they would do things differently, again, we can break it down into the strategic and the operational. Strategically, if you were going to do this properly or intelligently, maybe they would have waited. Maybe they would have made sure they did what George Bush, who curiously maybe is a better example than, than Netanyahu, did before, after 9-11 and co gather a coalition, get, get Arab countries, get Western countries, get you know, Eastern countries on board, you know, have a diplomatic offensive before a military offensive, and then, you know, proceed to ensure that there is a, a broad swathe of support across the world for what you're doing. And but most, most importantly, operationally, you, you show much more discrimination in your targeting. You can use different, uh, you know, weapon systems. You know, there's no point drop if you drop a 500 pound bomb on a building. Is going to demolish that building. If you're doing that to destroy a single rocket launcher, you know, there are different weapon systems you can use. The Israelis, you know, when, when I was in Afghanistan, the Israeli, we had an Israeli uh, weapon system, which is a very, very precise missile. You could literally watch it go through a window. They have this technology that they can use. These are, we're not talking about heavily fortified structures they're trying to destroy. These are, these are you know, you know the structures of an insurgent. They have the technology they can use, which would limit civilian casualties. But what that would mean is that this, this uh, battle would take a lot, lot longer. And there's the higher possibility of civilian, uh, wrong, Israeli military casualties. And the, well, the appetite Mr. by the current Israeli government is... Not necessarily pardon me, to, pardon to prevent me there. Uh, civilian casualties, but it's to use. Besides it taking a lot longer, what, yeah, about, what about the cost to, you know, um, its humans, its soldiers, for instance? Wouldn't it mean that it would lose more men on the ground if it adopted that approach rather than, you know, bombing from the air? Just a thought. Yes, it, it would. Yes, it would, definitely. And this is the point, is that... The Israelis would have to take, and this is and this is about military risk. You balance the risk of higher military casualties um, and lower civilian casualties. That's operational risk. But the strategic risk is that you now have ten thousand Palest dead Palestinians, a majority of whom are children, um, who uh, that blood is now on the hands of the Israeli government. And for years, this is going to you, you now have ten thousand people out of a population of uh, two million, um, all of their relatives, all of their friends, all of their you know supporters who now want revenge. So by saving maybe a, a thousand Israeli lives today, you've created maybe two or three different insurgencies for the next two or three generations, and it will cost another 10,000 Israeli lives. So strategically, it doesn't make much sense from my perspective. But again, I'm sitting in a, in a room in London. I'm not sitting in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem. So this is my view. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's open to debate. But I believe that, uh, that sacrificing that operational risk creates a much bigger strategic risk. And the points that maybe we're not addressing and maybe we as Africans should be looking at is what does it mean for us in Africa? Because when Al-Qaeda was defeated and Islamic State came out, all of a sudden our Boko Haram went from Boko Haram to Islamic State West Africa province. So what happens when Hamas is defeated and becomes, you know, Hamas uh, 2.0? Will we suddenly find people in, in Niger State or in Zamfara State suddenly declaring themselves Hamas 2.0? We already have had demonstrations in Abuja, you know, in support of the Palestinian cause. What happens when these turn violent? What happens when it turns from we, we are just demonstrating to um, we're going to attack people in sympathy with our Palestinian brothers? This mm. is the inevitable trajectory of virtually every conflict in the Middle East. And I think it's something we clearly need to understand. The more Palestinian, innocent Palestinian blood is shed, the more likely it is that we're going to get contagion, not only in Africa, but, you know, definitely in Western Europe and North America. And it's something that, you know, we really need to be considering at this point. And, you know, Mr. Warner, there are a number of implications that we could pick from there. But the first being, in the event that the war ends, you know, let's say, hopefully, uh, before the end of this month, you've talked about, you know, the, the damage, the destruction, the quantum of destruction on the ground in Gaza. Uh, how livable would um, that 
uh, uh, part of the Middle East be for Palestinians, a lot of them now, you know, uh, being killed amid this war. But how livable, livable would it be, you know, with, uh, is there a possibility of a lot of landmines here and there? And how long would uh, re rebuilding and reconstruction take to make the place livable for Palestinians in the future? You're hitting on a very, very, very good point and a relevant point, and and it, and it links back to what I just said before about the the second and third order effects of this, and what the effect of this the suffering of the Palestinians is going to have on the world. Because the short answer is, it's not livable. There's no way Gaza City will be livable for a long time. This operation is very unlikely to end this month. Um, it's going to most likely there will be heavy fighting in in the in the north of Gaza, and then most likely expand to the south of Gaza. And you've got too many people squashed up against the Egyptian border. The Egyptians are very reluctant to let them in, and even if they do let them in, they're going to spend this um, you know winter, the a Middle Eastern winter, in tents in the desert. Now it's Many people don't know this, but in, in winter in the desert, it's very, very, very cold. And because it's flat, you know, there's wind, it's, it, the temperature drops terribly at night. There will be immense human suffering. We're going to see for months pictures of Palestinian children in camps, freezing, no water. It's just going to be a constant bombardment of these terrible images. And that, again, goes to the point of inflaming, you know, world uh, uh, tensions in the world, you know, motivating people who are disgruntled or or whatever it is, to, to carry out attacks against um, other people simply because they, they're, they're now uh, radicalized by the Palestinian situation. So we're facing a massive humanitarian crisis in terms of the, the Palestinian population in Gaza. And there is no way that even if, this, even if this operation is completed this month, there is no way that Israelis are going to let the Palestinians back in. And even if they do, you've, you've got to negotiate how you're going to get in the necessary equipment, the, the bulldozers, etc., to clear the land to get rid of unexploded ordinance. It's just, you're not going to have the same mine issue you have in Ukraine. It's going to be unexploded ordinance and IEDs and booby traps, but it's still going to be there. And then start rebuilding these structures. This is a decade-long endeavor to rebuild the destruction. So mm. we're, we're facing, for the short term, what has to be one of the biggest humanitarian crises of, uh, you know, for, for, for a while, you know, almost as big as the Ukrainian issue, but mm -hmm. um, just on a different kind of context and scale. Huge points for reflection for leaders, you know, in that part of the country and indeed all over the world. I hope we have time for two more questions. But uh, this being the first of the two, the Israeli army took um, reporters out through a bombed out portion of um, Gaza Strip. Why do you think they did this? Is it for propaganda? No, I mean, that's just normal part of media operations. It's, I mean, there, there is a narrative that the Israeli um, military and government is, is uh, using that they are protecting the Palestinians from Hamas. And part of that was, you know, showing journalists, um, you know, the humanitarian corridor, proving that they are making some sort of an effort to protect civilians. Um, it, you know, don't really, one wouldn't read too much into it other than it's just part of the normal media operations that they that you know an army will conduct uh, at this time, and it shows that. But it does show that they're they're conscious of the fact that they need to control the narrative about you know how much suffering they're inflicting on the Palestinian people, but not enough to modify their operational kind of uh, uh, behavior. And lastly, Mr. Wanu, um, the. Um Implications of the increasing isolation of Israel, particularly in the Middle East, you know, with the commentaries coming from Arab leaders who are, you know, are neighbors to uh, that country. What does it mean for the safety of Israelis in the future, in the near and, uh, you know, long term? Um, well, Israel is the strongest country in the Middle East. It's not likely to be. I mean, although this war has been framed as an existential war for Israel's future, Israel is not in danger of being defeated or overrun by Hamas or any number of military powers. Egypt is not in any condition to attack uh, Israel. Neither Syria is definitely not in any condition to attack Israel. I mentioned these countries as they're the two countries who, who you know, fought Israel, you know, the most. Um, and the rest of the Arab world is, is in, has its own problems. The Arab world was normalizing relations with Israel. And there is not any country, I say, except maybe uh, Iran and to a certain extent Qatar, who has any kind of soft spot for Hamas. They would be quite happy for Hamas to be destroyed. But the Arab street, as it's, as it's called, you know, is deeply sympathetic to the Palestinian cause and the suffering of Palestinian people. 
So there's not a single Arab government that can, you know, normalize relations with Israel whilst the Palestinian people are being, you know, uh, are, are in this condition. So what we are looking at is a significant diplomatic effort after this, after this war, whenever that is, to rebuild these relationships. But that cannot happen as long as you have the type of governments that you have in Israel right now, in which you've got extreme uh, nationalist settlers um, who are quite openly calling for what we would consider ethnic cleansing or, or even in some cases genocide. Um, there's going to have to be a political realignment within Israel, a political realignment within the region. All of this taking place while you've got the humanitarian disaster of the Palestinian civilians and whatever replaces Hamas doing whatever they're doing, the Iranians doing whatever they're doing. It's a very messy situation and there are no quick short answers. It's just, it's going to take, the first step is going to be ending the conflict, um, some sort of political realignment in Israel that can legitimately negotiate with the Palestinians and with the wider Middle East and then the wider Middle East coming together um, as Arab or Muslim countries to uh, propose a solution to, to the Israel-Palestine issue. But the only good we can hope is that there may be some movement uh, towards um, you know, a, a legitimate two-state solution. But mm. it's very much dependent on all those facts that I just listed. Mm. And, you know, whether you talk about a political realignment or a legitimate two-state solution, you know, the commentary, particularly from uh, Palestine, would be that, you know, that cannot be possible if you don't tackle the root cause of this conflict in the first place. We'll have to leave it there for, for now. I want to thank you very much for your time and contributions on the program. We've been talking with security expert Mr. Chidi Umwanu, who joined us from London. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And still to come on the program, UN rights chief Volker Turk says war crimes committed on both sides of Israel Hamas conflict. We'll have that story and more coming your way after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back. The United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, Volker Turk, says war crimes have been committed by both Israel and Hamas in the conflict that erupted just over a month ago. Speaking of the humanitarian aid that has been delivered through Rafah, Turk said the lifeline has been unjustly, outrageously thin. He adds that there are three human rights imperatives to be observed during this war. They were war crimes as is the continued holding of hostages. The collective punishment by Israel of Palestinian civilians amounts also to a war crime, as does the unlawful, forcible evacuation of civilians. The massive bombardments by Israel have killed, maimed, and injured, in particular, women and children. The latest death toll that we got from the Gaza Ministry of Health is in excess of 10,500 people, including over 4,300 children and 2,800 women. All of this has an unbearable toll on human lives, on civilians. We have fallen off a precipice, and this cannot continue. Even in the context of the 56-year-old occupation, the current situation is the most dangerous in decades. Faced by people in Gaza, first and foremost, then in Israel, in the West Bank, but also regionally. During my visit here, I heard a lot of concerns expressed to me about double standards in the midst of this conflict. Let me be clear, the world cannot afford double standards. We must instead insist upon the universal standards against which we must assess, assess this situation. And this is about international human rights law and international humanitarian law. Gaza has already been described as the world's biggest open-air prison before the 7th of October. Under a 56-year-old occupation, and a 16-year blockade by Israel. 
the atrocities that were perpetrated by Palestinian armed groups on the 7th of October were heinous, brutal, and shocking. They were war crimes, as is the continued holding of hostages. Members of international NGOs gathered near the Eiffel Tower in Paris on Wednesday to demand a ceasefire in the Gaza Strip. Doctors Without Borders, Amnesty International and Oxfam were among the NGOs who participated in the event where the words cease fire now were projected on wall with the Eiffel Tower as a backdrop. The World Health Organization, WHO, in the latest of increasingly desperate United Nations appeals called for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire to prevent food, medicines and fuel supplies from running out in Gaza. Italy has sent a hospital ship close to the coast of Gaza to help treat victims of the Israel-Hamas conflict. The ship left on Wednesday from the western Italian port of Civita Vecchia with 170 staff, including 30 people trained for medical emergencies. Defense Minister Guido Crocetto says that Italy is also working on sending a field hospital to Gaza. According to the White House, more than 80 humanitarian trucks have entered Gaza in the past 24 hours and roughly 500 to 600 Americans have yet to get out of the Palestinian enclave. Thousands of Palestinian civilians trudged in a procession out of the north of Gaza on Wednesday seeking refuge from Israeli airstrikes and fierce ground fighting between Israeli troops and Hamas militants support of our embassy. Just a brief update on the crossing at Rafah. Over the last 24 hours, more than 80 more trucks carrying humanitarian aid was able to enter Gaza. That brings the total to 650. Again, not enough. We're going to continue to work to push that. Um, and as of now, we're aware of more than 400 Americans and families, uh, family members who have been able to depart and, uh, and sought the support of our embassy team on the ground in, in Egypt. There has been no change in that number since yesterday. So no more U.S. citizens or family members got out since the last time, well, since yesterday when I was up here talking to you guys. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu talked about an indefinite period where they would be on the ground. I think he was referring to the idea, the fact that in the immediate aftermath of conflict, it, it, it's, it's certainly plausible that for at least some period of time, Israeli defense forces are still going to be in Gaza um, to manage the immediate aftermath and the security situation. But that Nothing's changed about our view that that shouldn't be the long-term solution, that it shouldn't be about an IDF reoccupation of Gaza as a, as a long-term governance solution. Certainly the American citizens that we know are being held, but all of them. Um, and in order to do that, as we saw with the first four that got out, two Americans and then two Israelis a couple of days later, there were... There, there was enough of a pause in the fighting to allow for their safe passage, and that's what we're trying to get cemented, is a, uh, an agreement for as many pauses as, as might be necessary uh, to, to get all of them out. But it's a, it's a delicate negotiating process, and we're still, we're, we're still working at it. What I can tell you is that we want to stay open to the idea that it, it might take, in fact, likely could take, more than one humanitarian pause to get them all out. Newly returned United States citizens from war embroiled Gaza are asking the country to increase its efforts to get more Americans out. 60-year-old Zakaria Alaraishi, who spent nearly a month stuck in Gaza along with his wife, shared his difficult experience with the world during a press conference after being reunited with his family in the Detroit, Michigan area. Others are advocating for the quick return of other Americans still stuck in Gaza. And I hear like bomb next to us, you know. Whatever I say, you will not believe how was strong. I was crying. I'm 60 years old, crying. You know, all the kids around me, like, uh, coming to me. We don't know what to do. We don't know what to do. Everybody's scared. You know the bomb, you cannot sleep. You, this is this not like the noise. The noise, like, you don't know. I can't explain to you how you scary. People are scared from the noise for the bomb, from the rack. And this is like 
not normal for us. It's first time for me to see all this stuff, the war. I was scary. And uh, it was bad. Well, very bad, very bad time. What? Very bad. Thank you. No food. No word, just no light, no food. How is it going to be your life? Imagine. What do you want to say? They have no light, no food. And your kids are crying. They need food. What are you going to do? We have a lot of Americans over there, too. This is like in the north side. They, they cannot come in the south side because of the war. We need to get him out, if, take the uh, Red Cross to get him from home to make safe. And the USA can call Israel, don't touch these people. This is our people. They can drive from north to south, safe to the border to get him here. And I'm glad that my parents is back. But like my dad say, there's a lot of people out there need to be need to come out. The situation on TV is not like when you talk to somebody face to face. It's it's hard. What you see there and what they have there, it's totally different than what you see on TV. As much you see and hard on TV, it's it's more very uh -huh. bad, very bad over there. It was tough days. It was tough days for us. It was tough days. It wasn't, uh, like I was saying before, I, I haven't worked for almost a month. But she was with me on step by step. We're so happy that they were here. We honestly did not know if, you know, we're going to wake up and I'm going to wake up in the morning and say, get that call that said, our rush is gone. I can only feel for their family and their I believe 16 grandchildren and everything else that's, that's, that they had to endure to think about is, is grandpa or grandma coming home. Why is it that only two out of the 400 individuals that initially were evacuated was it United States citizens? Isn't Israel our greatest ally? Can't we call Israel? Is Egypt our ally? Can we not make resolutions to try to help our United States citizens to get out? I'm asking our Secretary of State and our Secretary of Defense to do more, do more. There are still hundreds of United States citizens stuck in that hellhole of Gaza. We're asking you to do more. Well, there are other Americans that are not so lucky that are still stuck in Israel. It's time now for more conversations on this as we have joining us Dr. Humphrey Ojiako. Dr. Ojiako is speaking to us virtually from Abuja. Thank you for coming on the program. Thanks so much. It's good to have me this morning. Thank you. Yeah. Indeed, we'll be looking at the efforts of Americans a little later on. But let's start with what is most recent, which is uh, that the Israeli Defense Forces uh, said just yesterday that um, the Hamas are losing control of this war. In fact, they've lost control of northern Gaza. Um, what does that say about the prosecution of this war? Are we nearing an end sooner rather than later? Uh, uh, thank you uh, for raising the question. I don't think so. Uh, first of all, I think there is a lot of um, uh, strategic blunders of both sides of, uh, of this uh, new war. Uh, first of all, Israel failed to protect its uh, people, its citizens and this country on the 7th of uh, October. I therefore seems to be pushing for this uh, policy of occupation and colonization, actually. That's, that's what we're beginning to look at. That's not looking like something that's going to end very soon. Because uh, lashing out means you're emphasizing vengeance as a strategy of war. What is the objective? Uh, is uh, acceptance of this uh, very excessive collateral damage. Uh, is this something the global community should accept? Um, what does that actually do? I think ultimately, Israel is putting itself in greater danger than it already has been through history. Yes, 
Hamas committed a very huge strategic uh, error by inviting Israel not to show uh, its, its own grievances of, uh, of uh, not having a sovereign state, but it exhibited a lot of hatred in the way Amman had carried out his effort. But that said, Israel's response is uh, also a huge strategic error that is not going to uh, bode well, not for Israel or the Israelis, and not for the Palestinians uh, either anytime soon. Uh, because uh, I think Israel is, in fact, right now, creating more terrorists for years and decades ahead. Because um, history uh, is, uh, is, 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 is so that it doesn't easily forget this kind of wound. The kind of wound Israel is committing in, uh, in Gaza is not what history forgets easily. That is it. Our history is the history of the Palestinians. I don't see them um, uh, forgetting this. And if you ask me honestly, uh, Israel is eroding the very useful uh, consequences of a long diplomatic grind over the past many years and decades when it has uh, won rapprochement with Egypt, with Jordan, with uh, the UAE, with Qatar and was at the brink of uh, closing uh, a deal of the tongue with, um, with Saudi Arabia when this invasion took place. So what Israel is doing in Palestine now is returning the rhetoric from what has regraduated to uh, Pal uh, Israeli-Palestine crisis or war to is going to go back to Arab-Israeli war and crisis, and that is not good for Israel. Israel is also losing global sympathy. And um, in fact, even if that tips its war end of uh, destroying Hamas, another set of uh, people will rise up to replace Hamas, and this, this will continue. So I don't see an end to any of this as uh, soon as uh, we think. And if um, United Nations agencies and its experts, who are trained to be very careful in their use and choice of language, are now beginning to use words like um, indiscriminate slaughter, like um, uh, Gaza becoming a graveyard for children, uh, ethnic cleansing, and their stock, as you can as you can attest to, of um, uh, leading to uh, to genocide. These are not words that are easily thrown around by responsible diplomats across the world, least of all United Nations diplomats. And that's beginning to happen. In fact, all of that together doesn't tell me that uh, this crisis is going to end anytime soon with the defeat of Hamas in, a, uh, in, a, in the Gaza Strip. This strategic um, misdeed of Israel that you talk about, which international diplomats are beginning to condemn. Of course, um, it has also been condemned in many uh, European countries during pro-Palestinian protests, where uh, the pro-Palestinian protesters have said unequivocally that Israel is culpable of humanitarian uh, offenses. Talk, about, talk to us about this culpability, particularly if um, uh, the United Nations will have the political will to bring the administration um, under the Benjamin Netanyahu-led government to book concerning uh, the civilian lives that have been lost amid the prosecution of this war? Uh, frankly, I, I do not think that um, if, uh, if, if um, any kind of peace or resolution would um, occur in the uh, Israeli-Palestine crisis that is uh, blooming into probably a regional war. It will not be achieved by the Benjamin Netanyahu government. In fact, I refer to this government as a, a coalition of uh, ultra-right, extreme-right uh, parties. And um, they do not believe in, the, in, in any political process to, to resolve this um, long-lasting uh, problem the world has faced since 1948. They're not interested in that. And in fact, I think that uh, the, the, the reason for this kind of uh, scorched 
earth approach, uh, indiscriminate uh, bombing and the killing of uh, children and so on, is to put uh, any talk of, uh, of a political settlement at bay to, to, to keep it uh, frozen. Uh, and um, that is Dr. Uh, what Dr. I see that is playing out here. If I may come in there, if I may come in there, I'm talking about Please. the United Nations under this current leadership, uh, particularly the Security Council. Would it be able to summon the courage to ensure the prosecution of this government, the Israeli government, for uh, the civilian lives that have been lost during the prosecution of this war? Uh, and will the divisions, by the way, of calls on uh, ceasefire, on, on the, the government to ceasefire, would it in any way affect the resolve to ensure that this government is brought to account for the lives, the civilian lives particularly, that have been lost during the prosecution of the war? You know, uh, we often tend to mistake the United Nations as um, a state or municipal power authority that could just go out and do whatever it wants. So, for the United Nations, I do not think it's a matter of will. The United Nations itself, as presented by the UN Secretary General, has made statements that have gone beyond what um, normal UN diplomat uh, chief would say, uh, like saying that this is valid on, uh, on, on genocide. But on its own, if the United Nations Security Council remains as divided as it has been, especially since the outbreak of the uh, Russia-Ukraine war, there has been a total polarization of the UN security system. In that kind of situation, it becomes uh, very difficult to get the two sides together. Okay, take a look at what is going on in the UN. Every resolution brought up is uh, either killed immediately or vetoed by the United States and so on. And even there's no agreement on whether a ceasefire, which is what is required, because when you are talking of uh, humanitarian pause, what are you pausing to do? Is it after one day, two days, three days, you resume the slaughter of uh, Palestinian civilians and people again? Is that what pause means? So the UN on its own cannot do anything without the, the, the corporate consensual agreement of uh, the five Security Council members who will take the rest along and say, this has to stop. And when it stops, those who bear responsibility for war crimes or for uh, attempted genocide or stuff like that will be brought to order to give account of their activities. It takes the United Nations Security Council working together to achieve any of that. If they can't agree, if America is on one side, and Britain, France uh, on one side, China and Russia on the other side, uh, then those who are following them, follow them. It's not going to go anywhere. Probably this is where the, the middle force would need to come in. If Africa was pulling its weight, maybe the African Union would be the reconciler here, bring the two sides together and say, listen, this has to stop. So Russia, yeah, 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 yeah. interests and those of uh, the United States must converge on this particular issue of the Palestine problem because the world is feeling guilty. That's why you see all these demonstrations all over the place. Nobody can watch what is going on in Palestine and go to sleep quietly. So maybe this is the time for the world outside the United Nations to put pressure on the security members to say, listen, this thing has to stop. We hope that that pressure will yeah. work. One can only hope. I've got a couple of more questions for you, but we have time for just one, and which is, you know, what's on the minds of everyone, particularly uh, around the Middle East area, and that is, will Benjamin Netanyahu survive, you know, uh, will his administration survive beyond uh, the prosecution of this war? And in, in, other, uh, in, in other terms, is he the man to chart a new political future for Israel, particularly its relations with the Palestinians after this war era? You know, I, I made an, a statement earlier that I do not think it is in the 
uh, political calculation of Benjamin Netanyahu and the outright government he leads at the moment to think of anything like uh, a political solution uh, to, to this problem. I think even the, the way Amanada are waging this uh, war shows that they just want to freeze any talk of, uh, of, um, of uh, political settlement. Because take a look at the Likud uh, party that Benjamin Netanyahu leads now with um, uh, other extreme right parties joining them. They are the people who have uh, insisted on over 500,000 uh, Israeli settlers in the, in, the, in the West Bank. They are the people who have uh, insisted on over 200,000 Israelis occupying the East Jerusalem, which ought to be, be part of, 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 uh, of, the, of the West Bank. There is a, a huge um, vacuum, that is to say, there is no territorial contiguity between uh, Hamas-controlled uh, Gaza Strip and uh, the West Bank. Do you think, does anybody think that the uh, Netanyahu government is the kind of government that will allow that kind of territorial access to combine the two zones to operate at one sovereign country. This makes it extremely impossible for some of us to believe that any headway will be made by the international community for as long as Benjamin Netanyahu and his um, uh, Erez Israel believers. These Erez Israel believers are those who believe that the entire land of Palestine is a traditional, historical home and land of the Jews. And in fact, if you left it to them, they wouldn't let go until they annex every inch of that territory. So uh, if the world is going to be looking for peace, maybe pressure should be mounted. And that pressure is coming out in various capitals of the world. Um, in the Arab world, uh, I think this thing is uh, going to go back to arab Israeli conflict. And that may put more pressure on the United States and the other Security Council members to some Listen, some change has to take place, but that change will not uh, happen under Benjamin Netanyahu. I'm sorry. And, you know, that could continue, as some would also say that, you know, moderate leaders in the Middle East, particularly in Israel in the past, who have told the path of peace and were not extreme, had been assassinated. I don't want you to talk about that. Perhaps we'll have time for that, you know, in subsequent conversations. Dr. Ojiako, I want to thank you very much for your time and contributions on the program today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And more stories now. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken met with his South Korean counterpart in Seoul uh, as bilateral discussions were overshadowed by issues surrounding the Israel-Gaza conflict and the ongoing war in Ukraine. The talks were centered around growing military ties between North Korea and Russia while he maintained efforts to broker humanitarian pauses in the Israel-Hamas war and long-term solutions for Gaza. Blinken arrived in South Korea on Wednesday after a meeting in Japan of G7 foreign ministers where he told a news conference that the United States remains focused on the Indo-Pacific despite other global challenges. Blinken was on a two-day visit to South Korea, the first by a U.S. Secretary of State in two and a half years and part of Blinken's broader Asia trip that includes a later stop in India and an earlier stop in the Middle East. And groups of volunteers are helping to keep the communities attacked by Hamas alive from actively farming in red cabbage fields to making sure fridges are cleared of rotten food and electricity is safely turned off. The volunteers, together with the Israeli army, clear up the towns and the kibbutzim affected by the attacks in the hope that their communities will come back to settle one day. The war has descended into the bloodiest episode in the generations-long Israel-Palestinian conflict. While now the IDF, which will win this war, is doing everything in its power to maintain the functionality here in order that when these families, these dear people will come back here, they, they will be able to call this place home back again. We go from house to house, clean refrigerators, turn off electricity, um, and that's 
more or less what we do. This is not a small problem. This is a huge issue dealing with our food security. If we don't help these farmers, we're not going to have vegetables, we're not going to have fruits in the supermarkets and in the fridges. Everything that you said, Guy, about the fact that we need this simple aspect of living in order to continue to hold an entire country. We need it not only that, but in order to make sure that all of these thousands of incredible people who are farmers can continue to have a dignified living. And we're a people, we're brothers and sisters, we live here together. We're here to help each other in arms in these times of war and these, these horrible, tragic times. And that does it on the program today. Thank you so much for watching. Join us again tomorrow when we'll bring you another episode of our continuing coverage of the Israel-Hamas conflict. I am Bukola Koka. Bye for now.